All right, so with its sophomore season now out, The Bear has easily established itself as one of the best TV shows out there. Season one grabbed your attention and held it, offering refreshing alternative versions of standard TV tropes, mixing familiarity and surprise like a well-crafted restaurant dish would. Since the season ended so well, neatly tying up the story package on a bittersweet, optimistic end, I sort of doubted that The Bear needed a second season, but boy was I wrong. Season 2 expands the world of the bear into artistic maturity, exhaling that giant held breath from season 1 into a flowing, stylistic narrative that shows these writers and everyone involved truly know what they're doing. The bear has a distinctive flavor, a visceral, anxious tempo interrupted with patches of stirringly quiet human reflection, and season 2 delivered on that consistency while stretching into new arenas of storytelling. Was it absolutely perfect? I mean, pretty close. The Bear's strongest attribute as a show is that it knows exactly what it is. Where other projects try to be the best show ever made of all time always, The Bear stays in its lane. And I mean that in the best way possible. The show has a bold, firm identity, and there's so much to admire about it. Beautiful acting performances, a stunning mix of cinematography where every frame is lovely to look at, but also communicates a feeling that fits each moment perfectly. The lighting, the blocking, the pacing, the acting accuracy to the industry and Chicago, but at the end of the day, The Bear is able to do what it does to be the show that it is, thanks to immaculately organized storytelling. So sometimes the best way to understand the forest is to look closely at a few trees, and as such, this video will unpack that organized storytelling and thematic resonance of The Bear by examining three standout episodes from season two. Episode 4, Honeydew, Episode 6, Fishes, and Episode 7, Forks. Each of these episodes constitutes a break in the standard structure of a season-long narrative. One of them is a standalone prequel episode taking place entirely at a family dinner, and the other two present supporting character side quests. But first of all, not a single scene of the bear does just one thing. Every second counts, in the kitchen and on the storyboard, and what we'll see in these episodes is remarkable efficiency in moving several things along at once, moving the plot while telling intricate character stories that are bound up in a consistent, resonant theme of this season. Taking the form of Carmi's chaos menu, this season of The Bear seems like a disjointed narrative, but there's actually nothing disjointed here at all. Much like cooking, if you master the fundamentals of storytelling, you can lay a strong foundation that allows for creative maneuvering and surprising the audience. That's exactly what we have here. By unhooking itself from the successful tightness of season one's narrative, and by choosing to focus on the run-up to the new restaurant's opening rather than skipping ahead, this season of The Bear stretches to build strength, recognizing that the arsenal of lovable supporting characters from last season deserve more time. The whole thing felt like a writer's party, like a fun but challenging exercise. We have a collection of charismatic characters, united by their need for the new restaurant to do well, all sent on mini self-improvement quests that intersect and overlap, all while nudging the plot along towards opening night. The narrative is decentralized, but again, not disjointed, because it's meticulously well-organized and every subplot hammers home the same theme. The organization and thoughtfulness behind the apparent chaos is precisely what I felt was missing from Ted Lasso, which likewise broke from its debut season's centralized narrative to expand into a constellation of subplots, but in a way that was neither neatly tied back to the central plot nor artistically grounded in one cohesive theme besides being all in the same universe. So what's the united theme here? Well, I think Aristotle would be delighted. First of all, as Aristotle suggested in the Poetics, subplots must tie back into the main plot. This season, everything is hinging on a successful opening night. We establish stakes right away. We gotta open in three months. We gotta turn a profit right away. We gotta pay back our investor in 18 months. So every micro journey matters. We need good desserts. We need fire suppression. We need leadership. We need a good menu, etc., etc. In other words, all those side quests are justified by narrative stakes. Moreover, the character journeys this season are all bound up in the cohesive theme of purpose. And I'm making the comparison to Aristotle here not just for the heck of it, but because I think it helps explain why the bear is so successful, why people from all walks of life get something out of it. 
And it's that literally ancient idea, identified and made famous by Aristotle, that we humans on Earth may never acquire a true understanding of abstract goodness, but we can still live virtuous lives through good habits and respect for one another. Getting up early, peeling mushrooms, clocking in, getting dressed, staying focused, this season of The Bear told a handful of unique yet synchronized character stories of people finding purpose through habit and hard work. But it's obviously not about everyone turning into mindless drones, far from it. Purpose here helps everyone step into themselves in a way that lets them flourish creatively as part of a team. I think that's why it's such a satisfying watch. It feels good to know that Marcus, Tina, Richie, Sydney, everyone there has struggled to be where they are, but have landed somewhere they belong. And it's crucial that they're all underdogs in their own way. This season is riddled with references to sports, from Sydney reading about Coach K to the Fenway poster, football references, Scottie Pippen, that's no accident. There's a lot of overlap between trying to make it as a restaurant and trying to make it as a sports team. The hustle, the isolated lifestyle, the training, cuts and bruises. And I cut myself and I got garlic and onions and peppers in my fingernails and in my eyes and my skin was dry and oily at the same time. I had calluses on my fingers from the knives and my stomach was fucked and it was everything. And from a storytelling perspective, our natural disposition to root for the underdog is part of why good sports movies are so moving. Rooting for the underdog is literally a tale as old as time. It's baked into the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's 17-step infrastructure for classic storytelling, adapted by Christopher Vogler into 12 steps for screenwriting storytelling in particular. And as testament to how organized this season is, the hero's journey is featured in two of the three episodes we'll look at. I won't walk through it step by step in this video, it's enough to know that the journey features a reluctant hero traveling from their ordinary world to a special world, whether it's an enchanted forest or a three-star restaurant, where they face tests, make allies, confront challenges, and ultimately return to their ordinary world with a new skill or ability of some sort. We root for the hero because their battle is uphill, and that's true of every character in The Bear. So let's go ahead and look at those three episodes, after which I'll turn to Sydney and Carmi. Spoilers ahead for both seasons of The Bear, and as a mega quick recap, season one introduced us to Carmen Berzato, a chef of legendary status who returns to Chicago in the wake of his older brother Mikey's death by suicide. Carmi is left to run the beef, the family restaurant, so he hires Sydney, an ambitious, classically trained chef who keeps Carmi accountable and on track while they both face resistance from the staff at the beef. The season ends with Carmi discovering that the huge loan Mikey had taken from their uncle had been saved for him to open up the restaurant Carmi and Mikey had dreamed about together, The Bear. Season 2 focuses on the challenges of opening a restaurant at every level, financial, professional, mental, physical, ultimately leading to friends and family opening night. Along the way, Carmi gets distracted by his lifelong crush, Claire, Sydney learns about leadership, and the rest of the staff, including Natalie, aka Sugar, who's sort of come on board to help with management, all hone up their professional skill sets. So let's dive into those standout episodes, 4, 6, and 7. And also, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel, and if you have, welcome back. You like Pippin? Who's Pippin? Scotty Pippin. He's like that with Michael Jordan. Who's Michael Jordan? I know, I know you know who Michael Jordan is. Episode 4, Honeydew, is the first shakeup of the season. And before we get into it, it's worth noting the efficiency behind this episode. When season 1 starts, Marcus is one of the unwelcoming kitchen crew, and Carmi's gotta win him over. Carmi tells him to put a baking tray of water in the oven so that the sandwich rolls get steamed while they bake and retain their moisture. Marcus doesn't like the idea, but he tries it, and it works, so Carmi earns his respect. That exchange does several things. We, the audience, have likewise just met Carmi, so we too are persuaded that he knows what he's doing. Marcus starts to respect not only Carmi, but also the chemistry of baking and the creativity behind the project. He had worked at McDonald's for years and hated the mindlessness, so now he's got a chance to grow and understand the creativity, room for improvement. 
because we spend time on the baking of the sandwich rolls, when Sydney later realizes that they should outsource that, we can understand just how much capacity that frees up. And finally, we get that Marcus is adaptive and willing to learn, something that pays off hugely in this episode, Honeydew. Again, this show feels so satisfying and fun to watch because every moment of payoff is a result of meticulously pre-planned setup. The episode takes place in Copenhagen with Chef Luca, but this shakeup isn't just for fun. In the past, Carmi trained in Copenhagen and he worked alongside Luca, so every scene of this episode does two things. It develops Marcus's story in the present timeline and fleshes out Carmi's past for us. In episode 6, when we see how Carmi doesn't quite fit in with his family, we can understand why. In that sense, even though Carmi doesn't really appear in this episode, he's there the whole time. Again, nothing disjointed here. Now, the first episode of season 2 doesn't start in the restaurant or with Carmi or Sydney. It's actually with Marcus at his mother's side. And it's establishing what the ordinary world is for him on his hero's journey. He's a caretaker, and we get the sense that at least a part of him hasn't really been living life fully. Marcus recognizes that he's sort of plateaued on his skill levels and he needs new inspiration, so Sydney sends him to Copenhagen. And this definitely is his first trip since his mom got sick, and based on his life story, maybe his first trip ever. And the show takes its time to ease us out of the regular rhythm of normal episodes with longer scenic shots, different music, and plenty of time showing Marcus explore. There's a lonely melancholy blended with hopeful optimism in this episode, putting the audience in a new space along with Marcus. He's in a special world now, on the culinary level, yes, but also the personal one. Marcus's challenge isn't just to hone his skills, but also to accept joy and success without feeling guilty. Luca was this season's first fun guest, and he gives out a piece of Aristotelian wisdom. Life isn't about being perfect, it's about improving day by day. You can't be the best, but you can be better than you are once you accept that. Luca also tells Marcus to make sure he spends time living outside the kitchen to get inspiration to make his food even better. Good cooking comes from a life well lived, time well spent, every second counts. It's no accident that this mentor-mentee pair bonds emotionally while performing a repetitive task. Over and over in this episode, Luca will tell Marcus, again, chef, do it again, do it again, keep going. But the other peak of this episode is when Marcus rescues a cyclist in the middle of the night. It's a weird scene that initially had me a bit confused, but as I sat with it, I realized that this moment symbolizes what Marcus has to accept internally. Very simply, life goes on. He saves this guy's life, and Marcus feels like they should go to the hospital or something, but the guy just gets on his bike and leaves. Marcus is left in this peculiar silence, and he sort of lingers before moving on. And I'm not saying that his mother is akin to this rando stranger, of course not, but the freakish part of death is that life does carry on afterward. Marcus could orient his whole world around caring for his mom, but when she dies, which it seems may happen off screen at the end of the season, the world will keep spinning. Marcus is here reminded that every second counts, and when he returns to the ordinary world back home, he might take that pursuit of joy a bit too far by asking Sydney out in the middle of work, which isn't the best move, but he's also able to absolutely nail the dessert menu and seemingly have fun while doing so. Last season, his perfectionism over the donut got in the way of getting work done, but his lessons with Luca helped him let go of perfectionism and pursue improvement instead. And did I cry a bit when he tells Carmi that the cannoli is called the Michael? Certainly. I do, however, wish that we had spent a little more time getting insight into his patisserie skills and what the inspiration was, like what that cannoli actually tastes like. I know his creations are good, but I'm curious for more info on the cooking side. But all in all, this episode, loosely structured around the hero's journey, is a beautiful exercise in filming style, character growth, and thematic clarity. Ending the season with Marcus and Sydney on a kind of weird vibe and getting foreboding texts from his mother's nurse cues Marcus up to be a big character next season, and I'm here for it. He's wonderful, and he absolutely deserved the special attention of this beautiful episode. We could do this, you know? Yeah. 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 Let her rip. 
Well, if honeydew was our calming palate cleanser, fishes is an hour-long anxiety attack. A total surprise of an episode, that we'd get a standalone backstory, that it would be halfway through this season, that it would comprise a delightful assortment of A-list guest stars, fishes showcases a wide variety of writing genius. The overload of celebrity actors actually helps build up the frantic mania of the episode. If it were only Jamie Lee Curtis or only Bob Odenkirk, we'd know where to look in any given scene. But our eyes and minds can't rest as we whip around from Gillian Mason to John Mulaney to Sarah Paulson and so on and so on. Now, I won't walk through it scene by scene, but the episode starts with Nat and Mikey speaking outside the house. It's a great way to build tension without throwing us right into the chaos, as we can tell they're getting a breather from something, and we then have to enter the home with them as if we're arriving as a real guest. This opening also highlights how spaces within the house are taken seriously as storytelling tools. Characters filter in and out of the kitchen, hallways, the pantry, a sitting room, and this fluidity is both realistic to a family party and brilliant for pacing. We can't be dialed to 11 for a full hour, so we get these moments of respite in quiet bedrooms and private conversations. The bear does this all the time, with people put in cars, a locker room, a fridge, contained spaces that provide tonal shifts and make us feel like we inhabit their world along with them. So it's Christmas Eve, and the Berzato family and guests are celebrating with Matriarch Donna's rendition of the Feast of Seven Fishes. In Roman Catholic tradition, you can't eat meat or animal fat on Christmas Eve, leading to the Italian-American tradition of cooking fish in oil instead. Do I personally consider fish meat? Yes, but I don't make the rules. Now, there might not be a sign on the wall saying every second counts. Instead, the entire episode is brutally punctuated with the shrill ringing of Donna's timer, which always prompts a new task. Move this, stir that, pull those, and so on. So on the tangible level, the timer keeps things rolling, and it also feels like the countdown to total eruption. Mikey snapping, Lee snapping, Donna snapping. We know something big is coming, like Carl Army is worried about all the time, we can sense another shoe is gonna drop. But even beyond that, knowing that this episode takes place five years in the past loads the hour with a dreadful sense of foreboding. A lot's gonna happen in between then and now. Richie will get divorced, the kids will be largely estranged from their mom, and of course, Mikey is going to die. It's gut-wrenching to think about, but that ticking timer in the background and constant references to Mikey's future, they don't let us forget. It hurts to watch him suffer in this episode because we know what's coming. And this side of this season's time motif, this anxious, depressive side, complements and complicates the more optimistic vision of time we'll get in the next episode perfectly. Another feature of this episode is its visceral materialism. In any episode, the bear usually grounds us in some sensory detail of the scene. So there might be tons going on in the background, but in the foreground, we're focused on the chopping of celery or fat sizzling in a pan or whatever. In Honeydew, the background silence heightens the shaking of Marcus's hand as he places slivers of hazelnut or whatever nut that is, I don't know. In this episode, we're absolutely oversaturated with these details. The kitchen is grimy and bubbling and overcrowded to the point that when Donna yells at people to get out, I want them out too, I'm overheated right there with her. This ground level, detail-oriented perspective speaks to the broader approach to storytelling in this show. Everything in the story world is only present as through the experiences of the characters. For example, take the idea of economic anxiety. It's real here, it's present. We feel it when Richie asks Cicero for a serious job. Now, in another show, Cicero might be used as a handy financial plot device or a representative of capitalism. But here, he's neither a benevolent giver with no parameters, I'm looking at you, Rebecca Welton, nor is he a mustache-twirling greedy villain. Or another example, Natalie, the only daughter of the family, feels a compulsive empathy for her mother that she can't shake even though she knows it's unhelpful. And when she lets out that fatal, are you okay, the only person at the table to speak in her defense is the only other female Berzato there. And of course, Donna's meltdown is equal parts unsolicited martyrdom and a very fair, lonely sorrow. After all, she's speaking to generations of women who have made beautiful things for others while no one made beautiful things for them. But it would be completely inaccurate to say this episode is about economic anxiety or it's about women in the home. Those elements are there. 
but only as experienced lived phenomena that manifests in visceral dramatic detail. Fishes isn't about any social theories or big ideas at all. It's just about the Berzados, told through painfully intimate details that happen to encapsulate bigger ideas. Speaking of which, there's a boatload of religious symbolism in this episode. It's Christmas Eve, of course, and characters argue over the origin of the seven fishes, but beyond that, we've also got Donna's name as a reference to Madonna, the Virgin Mary, a pregnant woman who needs a bed to rest in, Stevie's toast about taking people in, unusual video editing with a superimposed figure of Jesus on the cross, a long dinner table that seats, by my count, 13 people looking like the Last Supper, and finally, Mikey looking weirdly like Jesus as he heads outside, presumably to get high. I mean, look, I'm not trying to say anything here is an exact analogy, not at all. But I found this episode so disturbing, not just because of how scarily well it presents family tension, but I think also because it so subconsciously evokes the idea of sacrifice and martyrdom. And there's a solid amount of biblical imagery in other episodes, so I think the comparison is justified. I mean, look at Carmi getting out of the fridge like he's been in a cave for three days. But anyway, that idea of sacrifice and martyrdom is presented most obviously by Donna, who's been up since 4am toiling away, and then more subtly by Mikey. There's this tragic moment in the episode when Mikey breaks down over the drawing his little brother gave him. It feels like he knows the dream of the bear can never happen because of his addiction. And we know, of course, that he ultimately leaves $300,000 for Carmi. I'm not saying this is definitive or rational, but the Christ-like idea of individual death for the sake of collective rebirth has me looking at Mikey's death in a tragic new way. All in all, it looks like this episode is already established as a remarkable TV feat, and it's totally warranted. We learn so much here, and even though Carmi is just one of the many in the crowd, it's all informing our understanding of our main character, along with Natalie and Richie, even the facts, and Claire. The episode also builds up even more stakes for the bear's opening. We know what the bear means to Carmi, but we also see how much gravity this family holds, to the point where the guests are arguing over who's considered family and who's not. And we get a fuller picture on the missing head of the table in the present timeline. None of this is possible without the pristine character writing and story organization behind this episode. Everyone there has a distinctive flair and backstory to the point that everything that unfolds feels like it simply could not have gone a single other way. It's perfectly calibrated to have us on the edge of our seats with uncertainty, yet also holding a sense of inevitability. I was yearning for Mike to put that fork down, but I also needed him to hit Lee in the face. In short, all the micro details of this frantic episode transplanted the anxiety of the family into anxiety for the audience, all while crafting something beautiful in its delivery and universal in its themes. Right on the heels of that chaos fest comes my personal favorite episode of the season, Forks. And again, the bear places its episodes with hazelnut sliver precision. We've just had a big downer and we need a boost. And on top of that, we've just seen a hopeful, more energetic Richie building a family life and laughing alongside Mikey. So when the episode presents the lethargic, lost Richie, we're impacted by just how much this man has lost. Recall that in season one, he was sort of the antagonist, stuck in the old ways, not just to be difficult, but because it was his way of coping with the grief of losing his best friend. Now that the beef is closed, Richie is confronted with all the absences in his life. Wife and kid living away from him, best friend gone, best friend's little brother too busy for him, it's sad to sit with. So in episode one of this season, Richie, who's always loved his literature, compares himself to a Murakami character who's so useless and unpleasant that all his friends have dropped him, and now all he does is watch trains go by. And we'll see trains in the background of many early Richie scenes this season. That perfectly encapsulates how he feels, like everyone is moving on and leaving him behind. And I think that's something we can all relate to from time to time, right? Like, what is scrolling through social media but watching a thousand trains leave without you? But Richie isn't all negatives. This season, we see that he's a caretaker. 
In an early episode when Natalie's pregnancy was still secret, she doesn't look so well and he offers her a Sprite, which doesn't really mean anything, until episode 6 when we see him offer his pregnant wife a Sprite in the past. By everything we've seen, he's also a loving, supportive father. And this episode takes that quality of caring for people and translates it into a genuine professional and personal purpose. So after a series of maintenance-related screw-ups, Richie is sent to stodge at a three-star restaurant. If Marcus's path this season loosely follows the infrastructure of the hero's journey, Richie's follows it to a T. Here, he's quite a reluctant hero. He's got no interest in polishing forks at age 45, and he thinks Carmi is just trying to get rid of him. But he doesn't even protest, he just does it. The restaurant is the opposite of Richie. He's never been one for manners or cleanliness or pretension, fanciness, whatever. But what we'll see develop here is a pretty close embodiment of Aristotle's understanding of virtue and habit. When we start, Richie snoozes his alarm, can't stand his own face in the mirror, but the sheer force of repetition slowly breaks him out of his funk. When Richie continues to scoff at the whole fine dining world, Garrett gives him a pretty good talking to, saying, look, you don't have to buy into the whole thing. You just need to show up and respect it and respect yourself. To which Richie responds with one of the best lines of the whole show, I can do respect. This conversation again echoes Aristotle in a way. You don't need to understand some higher truth. You just need to show up and live well. It's after this that Richie calls Tiff to say he scored the Taylor Swift tickets. And as we hear trains going by in the background, Tiff tells him she's getting remarried. An awful gut punch, but in response, Richie throws himself into his stage work, getting up earlier and earlier, asking questions, taking it all in. In this meaty, energetic part of the hero's journey, we get to have fun. Richie observes guests that are truly moved by the care they get at the place. He understands that the absurd obsession with one smudge isn't really about the smudge, but rather about the honesty and integrity required to maintain a high standard. While performing repetitive tasks together, Richie learns about his mentor Garrett's life. Richie had assumed that Garrett was or wanted to be a cook, but Garrett tells him no, this is it, this is what he wants. Acts of service helped him recover from a drinking problem, and it genuinely means something to have this job. Finally, he's allowed out of fork purgatory, he gets to wear a suit that feels like armor, and he's allowed to shadow in front of house. After learning key tricks of the trade like passing notes, eavesdropping, color coding, he's also allowed to carry out and present a dish, and he kills it, blending his new high-end tricks with his standard Richie energy. And again with this show, the details of the scene are all intentional. Not only is the dish he serves a Chicago classic right off the street that's been done up a bit, which is a nod to his own arc here, but it's also from a place called Pequod's, which is a real pizza shop, but it's also, I assume, named after the Pequod, the ship from Moby Dick, a book about man's search for meaning. I'd say that's just a coincidence, except they've made a point of showing that Richie reads a lot, so I'm pretty sure this is another thematic note. What we're seeing now is Richie as Richie was before Mikey's death, smiling, goofing around, showing interest in life. He even wins over the rest of the stoic kitchen staff. And this kind of meeting of the world is always a joy to watch. The second the Taylor Swift guitar starts going, the energy of the episode is contagious, right up through Richie's triumphant joyride blasting love story. No longer is he stagnant as trains go by, he's part of the traffic, part of the world. But the triumph of this peak is tempered with his realization that he has to go back to that ordinary world where he thinks he's not wanted. He can't even get Carmi's full attention on the phone. And it feels like this new form of him was fleeting until we meet Olivia Coleman as the modest, understated Chef Terry. Chef Terry was the perfect mentor for this scene. Her calm, methodical presence halts Richie in his tracks and gives us the chance to breathe too. This is the inmost cave of the special world, and here, like Luca and Marcus, Terry and Richie quietly peel mushrooms, doing a repetitive, meditative task, time well spent in routine. The episode ends with Richie realizing that every second counts isn't a depressing doom sign, but rather taken from Terry's father's journals, and it's a suggestion to take in and enjoy and respect every moment of your life, no matter how old you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you do, do it right. The episode is over, but Richie's return to the ordinary world afterwards is beautiful. He wears the suit, he apologizes to Nat, he tells Carm he gets it, and Carm knows exactly what he means. 
And crucially, in the finale, Richie is able to save the day by implementing those tricks of the trade he learned in this episode. How to organize chaos, basically, and how to listen. And everything we hear from Garrett and Terry in this episode feels almost like a meta-commentary on why the show creators made the show. How they take their audience seriously and want what they create to be immaculate and special. And it was. Richie's story, built on the hero's journey, wound up in the core theme of the season and absolutely vital to the stakes of the overarching plot is a textbook delivery of a human story. You know, what, a, what an interesting life it is to be a leader. It's something. This is the last Ted Lasso comparison, I promise, but this season of The Bear demonstrated how to de-emphasize the series' protagonists without having them just tread water all season. No spoilers, but season three of Ted Lasso basically had Ted and Rebecca just wheels spinning, waiting for the finale to come. Here, Carmi and Sydney often slide to the back burner to make space for episodes like Honeydew and Forks, but when you put something on the back burner, it should still be cooking. So while I don't think either of them had a complete satisfying arc from start to finish this season, I think it's clear that their slow development was largely setting the table for season three. This duo remains the main draw of the series, and it knows it. Look, here, they're supporting each other physically and emotionally. There's awesome scenes like this packed in to make sure we know that this is the heart of the season, and both of these characters sidestep standard character tropes. Rather than the egotistic, tortured genius, Carmi is the consummate younger brother. Rather than the young, rebellious spirit that has to learn from the genius, Sydney is a dignified professional who holds him accountable. This season, the duo worked in symmetric opposition. Sydney got further and further into the work of running a restaurant, while Carmi sort of drifted out of focus. I can't say that they were as fun to watch now as they were last season, but with two stunning acting performances and consistently thoughtful characterization, they were still magnetic screen presences, and every scene with the two of them in the kitchen is an absolute treat to watch. And that's sort of the central tension of where we leave off with Carmi, that opposition. So this season, Carmi is distracted from the bear by his lifelong crush, Claire, who was written a little too much like the ultimate dream girl, in my opinion. But that's okay. This plotline is, I think, supposed to feel sort of out of pace with the rest of the story world. This romance should feel a little unnatural. And I found myself rooting for Carm to just get back to work and focus. But Carmi's state of being reflects the darker side of that Aristotelian dedication gone too far. It's one thing to throw yourself into routine to feel alive, it's another to do it to feel numb. We know from the episode Fishes and from Carmi's beautiful monologues at Al-Anon that he grew up with so much rejection, insecurity, and anxiety that his only way out was deeper in, building a brutally lonely life to the point where he misses Mikey's funeral. He's got no friends, doesn't even enjoy his central passion. Both seasons end with Carmi receiving a message of love too late, one from his brother, prompting him to close the beef and open the bear, and the other a voicemail from Claire that prompted him to self-punish and rededicate himself to work, as if he was foolish for even thinking he could have a normal life. And as much as, I'll be honest, I sort of want to see that, I want to see him back in the kitchen, that's no way to live. So I think going forward after this season, he's either got to get back together with Claire or, I hope, heal his relationship with the industry by being the leader and partner that Sydney needs. Sydney's backburner action this season was her development as a leader. And to be honest, I felt this could have been a slightly stronger arc. Don't get me wrong, I adore Sydney, and I love the idea of her training not just her culinary skills, but also her understanding of leadership. Throughout the season, Sydney reads a book about Coach K, legendary college basketball coach, and she does implement his suggestions during the finale, act as a member of the team, don't make excuses, converse, listen, but this didn't feel like a new form of Sydney. I would have liked to have seen a little more contrast from A to B as she learns more. That said, her command and dexterity on opening night, that she was able to prove to herself that she can do this without Carmi, how she made her father proud, it was all lovely. I hope we continue to learn more about her backstory, and I hope they keep giving us food-centric scenes like Sydney making an omelet for Natalie. All in all, I think the character writing for these two characters as individuals was stronger in season one, but as a duo, their balanced dynamic and sincere mutual respect remains top level. 
I imagine Carmi and Sydney will take more of a center stage position next season, and I can't wait for that. They face the challenge of upending cycles of trauma, familial, professional, interpersonal, and when I think of the two of them working together, I think of Anthony Bourdain, who saw and reflected on the best and worst of the cooking industry, who had a gritty appreciation for the hell that chefs go through, but later in life reflected on how damaging and violent it can be. We'll see where they go next season, but I'm hoping Carmi will build a way out for himself by helping Sydney build her way in, and either way, I can't wait to see more from these two. Overall, this season was a masterpiece of fast-paced yet slow-burning narrative. This season peeled back what we saw in season 1 to get at the underlying foundation, which is literally what the characters do to their restaurant, breaking open the walls in a metaphorical representation of the stories we see here. And like that renovation project, this season gets everything ready for something else. I think we all assumed that we'd sort of see the new place up and running this season, and it was a bold and thoughtful writing choice to instead make space in the preparation stage. What we've seen from The Bear is basically proof that respecting well-worn storytelling fundamentals can yield bold, fresh, new stories. It might not be your all-time favorite show, it might not be on the global level of sweeping narratives, higher-scale shows like Succession or Game of Thrones, but The Bear will always make for an immensely satisfying, neatly packaged, heartfelt watch. This season, pristinely organized thematic centrality was the connective tissue that bound all those small stories together, and it really did feel like the perfect 10-course meal at a thoughtful, creative, fancy restaurant. I mean, I wouldn't know, but I imagine. And there's a ton missing from this video. Tina and Ibra's contrasting interest levels in culinary school was a great touch this season. Tina is eager and ready to go, but Ibra, who experienced and escaped the Somali Civil War, doesn't feel like being told what to do, and that's completely fair too. I actually think this storyline needed a little more breathing room throughout the season, particularly Ibra's side of it. Likewise, Natalie is sort of treated like a straight man here, someone rational for all the manic people to bounce off of, but she's got her own issues, and I feel like they sort of brushed over that. So yeah, there are a few potential weak points here and there, but I'm reaching, really. I obviously absolutely adore this show. It has so much heart and soul, and it takes great care in everything it handles. From obviously serious issues like addiction and suicide to more subtle significance like saying sorry and listening to people. The character work is outstanding, the pacing, hypnotic, the mastery of setting, dialogue, costumes, all are without fault. The attention to detail, how people wear their hair, what's in the background of any given scene, many callbacks like the same tie-dye t-shirt in two childhood photos in two different seasons, these all demonstrate just how much labor and love the showrunners handle this show with, and it pays off. I haven't really talked about it here, but The Bear is also genuinely hilarious in a brilliant way. One of my favorite jokes this season is when Pete shows up to the Feast of Seven Fishes with a tuna casserole. It's funny, because it shouldn't be a big deal, but it is, and he turns up late enough in the episode that we've inhabited this party for a while, and we didn't even need everyone's reactions to know that he's an idiot. We also learn about Pete and Natalie's dynamic, we get the sense of family insiders versus outsiders, we build up the significance of food and cooking, like any fish dish would be stupid, but something about the school night dinner of a tuna casserole hits that note perfectly. I know I'm going on and on about one note in one episode, but as I've mentioned over and over, the genius of this show is that one note does about six things and is funny. The humor isn't the end goal of the moment, it's baked into a character reflection. And I have to celebrate that here because of how painfully absent that approach to humor is in other comedies. Okay, that was my last shot at Ted Lasso. Overall, I was so relieved to be blown away by season two. This show is important to me on a few levels, including the one I've focused on here. It takes storytelling seriously. It takes its characters seriously. It takes deeply thoughtful and nuanced looks at grief, anxiety, extraordinarily human experiences like the inability to enjoy good things because you think a bad thing is coming, the competing pressures to live a happy life and be successful, to perform for yourself and show up for others. 
to process the past while building your future. What we even work so hard for and why. Look, I could talk about this show all day, but it really does speak for itself as you watch. And I made this video less to analyze the story and characters and more to demonstrate that the bear exemplifies why the art and skill of storytelling matters. How solid structures and pre-organized storyboards landed us the ultimate short form comedy drama. If you haven't rewatched yet, I highly recommend giving it more of your time. At a time when studios are cranking out series that they want us to just binge through mindlessly, it's important to admire and respect the immense care that goes into every gritty corner of this beautiful show. The writers have absolutely put into practice the message of the season. A good story is time well spent and every second matters. Let me know what you thought about this second season in the comments. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you who have subscribed or left a supportive comment. Thanks for being here and for helping the channel grow.